Hölgyeim és Uraim, tiszteltet köszöntök mindenkit, nagy tiszteltel és külön szeretettel köszöntöm az Egyetem a Kar nevében Kauri Sankar Gupta ügyekszenciáját, India nagykövetét, köszöntöm Orosz Marian Titkár, köszöntöm Dr. Mason Péter, rektorhelyetesodat, a nemzetközi kapcsolatok rektorhelyetesét, és köszöntöm Karunk részéről Dr. Orbán, Anna Mária nemzetközi tudományos dékáhelyetest, és felkérem, hogy nyissa meg, és vezesse fel a mai programunkat. His Excellency uh, Gauri Shankar Gupta, Ambassador of India to Hungary and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina too. And uh, he has a long career, uh, but he is also a recipient of uh, many gold medals and awards for excellence during his academic career. And uh, he has served for many years uh, in the foreign, Indian Foreign Service uh, in various countries. He visited more than 70 countries uh, during his career. And he was an ambassador to Mongolia between uh, 2003 and 2006. And he uh, started writing books then, and he published The Land of Blue Skies, Mongolia title. And he continued uh, this uh, habit, so to say, and very recently, in 2012, he published his book, uh, Andrea the History of Life, Modern Science and Ancient Wisdom. And we decide that to today's lecture will be related uh, to his book, but focused on the 21st century challenges. So this is his book, uh, and he will speak about it, but of course he will relate it to the problems and challenges of our century. So you are welcome, and I give the floor to His Excellency. Thank you. First of all, let me thank very profoundly to Dr. Gabor Feseli, the rector of this university, then Dr. Peter uh, Mosson, who is with us, the vice rector, <coughs> Mr. Joel Tansuch, and Anna Maria for giving me this opportunity to come to this wonderful university this morning and speak to you. I am also grateful to all of you for your large presence this morning. And I sincerely hope that my talk would be of some use to all of you. With these opening words, now I would like to go on the topic which is Modern Science and Ancient Wisdom Challenges of the 21st Century. So let us see what are the challenges we have today, what are the challenges we face in today's world. And if you have something more to add, we would be happy to add to what I have identified some of the principal challenges of the modern world. The first major challenge we have is the challenge of poverty and malnutrition. I think according to the World Food Organization and Food and Agriculture Organization, about 925 million people today suffer from poverty. They live subhuman existence. Some of them don't have food to eat. Some of them don't have habitation to live or clothes to wear. And a large part of them, 81% come from the developing countries, countries like mine, and then some come from the developed world as well. This is, of course, one of the great challenge of this century. 
Then we have these urban slums which are growing in large number in some of the countries. If you visit Mumbai in my country or if you visit Sao Paulo in Brazil or if you visit Johannesburg in South Africa, you will find large number of people living in very, very small uh, area in absolutely lack of sanitation, lack of water, electricity, medical facilities. And the children go in those slums, you know, without any facilities. So this is another big problem related to urbanization, which is, incre which is increasing these days. I hope you are able to understand me. Am I, you are hearing me? Okay. Now there are figures of malnutrition. That is, the, you eat food, but you don't eat uh, enough to keep your body in health, or you don't have enough nutrient in your food. That kind of figures are not available, but it is estimated that about one fourth of the world population today have or suffer from malnutrition. Either their food is deficient or they don't have enough uh, food to eat. So this is another major problem we have in this century. On the other hand, there is also a problem which you would have noticed. There is a tremendous amount of food which is wasted. You go to a five-star hotel, you go to a big restaurant, you would find a large quantity of food is just wasted and thrown in the garbage. This is another serious problem. On the one hand, we have the surplus food which is wasted. On the other hand, we have people who are not able to find food to eat. The second important problem which I call is, in economics they call it distributive injustice. It is the problem of distribution of wealth and income. It is not evenly distributed. There are glaring disparities. I don't know whether you know that 40% of global assets, global assets, are owned by 1% people in this world. 99% own 60%. You know, there there is a lot of disparity. They say about 80% have only less than 10%. While 1% population has 40% of global assets. Three richest individuals in this world, their total combined wealth is more than what is owned by 48 countries in this world. This is the amount of disparity we have. The 10 million millionaires, 10 million US dollars, that, that kind of millionaires, they own, in 2008, they owned 41 trillion dollars. 41 trillion dollars. That kind of people. So you can see that distributive injustice is enormous in today's world. On the one hand, you have people suffering from plenty. They don't know what to do with the money. On the other hand, you have people who don't have enough to eat at the end of the day. Now, if you look at uh, the increase in wealth and income over the last five, six centuries, if you go back in your own family, for example, your great-grandfather, or your grandfather, their income was very small. They used to have maybe 5,000 forints a month. And now the income has gone to, say, 50,000 forints a month, or 100,000 forints a month, or a million forints a month. Despite that, the people are more stressed. People are more, um, what to say, unhappy today, despite that. Uh, the wealth, the total wealth of the nations has grown up tremendously in the last five, six centuries, but the stress levels have actually gone up rather than coming down. That's another uh, important fact which has occurred in our times in this century. 
then you have the third problem which is unemployment you hear every day because you are the one who are going to go to the job market tomorrow and you will find it difficult to get a job it's a growing problem it's a problem which is despite tremendous increase in the wealth the employments are shrinking <coughs> today 12.6% population across the globe is unemployed in addition about 20% population are semi employed they have some sort of job but not good enough maybe 2 hours a day or 3 hours a day not a good enough job so it is estimated that we need today about 600 million new jobs to provide employment to everybody this is what is estimated uh, by ILO international labor organization and this is this trend has not really stopped it has become more and more acute in the recent past every year you add 5 million new unemployed people in the world 5 million new unemployed people so this is a very serious problem which we are facing and you are going to face is much more than my generation did imagine a person who does all this study and then after he gets a frustration and doesn't get a job or she doesn't get a job you know the image in his frustration or frustration and it difficult to sustain life so it's a very very uh, important social apart from the economic side a very social a uh, socially important factor in in the human life today then we have been talking about next problem which is <coughs> climate change or environmental issues i'm sure you are all hearing these things on television on uh, news papers news reports various international organizations are devoting a lot of time to these issues that Uh, the climate is changing ecosystem is changing it's becoming erratic uh, according to nasa the, uh, the us uh, agency they admit that there has been considerable increase in the greenhouse gases now greenhouse gases you know are the gases which trap the heat in the environment and then it means that the temperature on the earth goes up they don't allow this uh, heat to go out in the outer atmosphere that is the kind of greenhouse gases they are carbon dioxide methane nitrogen oxide cfcs they are quantum is increasing in the world in the earth's atmosphere then <coughs> we have this tremendous industrial activities if you go back in time just about 70 80 years we didn't have these large scale industries we had a small uh, and what you call cottage industries in in your homes in in towns you lived in in a farm in a small little place where you had your small industry you worked on agriculture you had your uh, you know cows for milk and you did, had some fruits and vegetables you grew and you made some handicraft that kind of life existed not long ago say 70 80 years ago now we have large scale productions you you go to a factory jeans the millions of jeans are made every day there are millions of suits are made the factories which have massive production so that uh, has caused a lot of contamination the contamination has come in terms of air uh, because of the pollution then there is water contamination lot of water is used for all these factories and then the earth the solid waste is destroyed on the earth so that the surface of the earth is also getting contaminated so these are uh, according to uh, these figures which are available now they say that the carbon dioxide levels have gone up from 280 ppm to 379 ppm particles per uh, what they call it Uh, it's a technical term ppm particles per uh, uh, per million yes per million and this is in the last 150 years this has gone up 
you see this is uh, since the uh, industrial revolution as we call it uh, the time of Adam Smith the wealth of nations and uh, from that time onwards and according to uh, these studies which have been done in various international bodies uh, the next century the temperatures of this earth will rise by 2.5 degree centigrade 2.5 it's not right here percent it's not percent but it's degree centigrade that would mean that a large number of islands will submerge the glaciers will disappear lakes will disappear large number of rivers will disappear because there would be no water coming from glaciers and lakes to those rivers and you can imagine without water what can be the life for us. So these are climatic issues. I, there are many more. I don't want to go into details because the second part of my presentation is more <laughs> uh, uh, interesting than this one. This you all understand very well. Then growing health problems and new diseases. This is another uh, big issue. You have all kinds of new diseases coming up starting from uh, cancer to Almeijer, uh, Al, call it Al, Alheimer, how you pronounce it? HIV. Yeah. HIV. Uh, HIV, you know, all kinds of new diseases which I don't even know. And some of them we don't know today, they will appear after some years. And uh, uh, you also will realize these days that the birth defect in children are much more than they used to before. There are not more children born with autism problems, the, the, the brain is not fully developed. There are not more children who are, de, who are born with handicaps, you know, some kinds of uh, problems. Then there are uh, problem of birth itself because the, they say that the sperm count has gone down so much in the recent years that uh, some people can't even produce children anymore. These are all scientific studies done because you, you, you would see these in the scientific journals. That sperm count has gone down considerably in the last five, six decades that you can't produce children anymore. Then, of course, uh, uh, there are addictions. Alcohol consumption has gone up. You would see the how much. Uh, if you calculate, I think it must be several hundred times in the last hundred years. Uh, smoking has gone up considerably and uh, some people pick up smoking in young age. They don't like it but it becomes very difficult to quit it because it's such an addictive thing. Then people are getting drugs, antidepressant tablets because they can't sleep in the night. So these things are increasing and giving more health issues, health problems. And there's another important thing which is concerning health problem is that the medications which you take today they have concentrated chemical content in it and therefore they cause reaction in your body after years. A large number of medications which were valid till recently have been taken out of market because they found that they were not good for the human health and they already created a lot of problems. The same thing is true with the food preservatives. You get all this tinned food and preserved food in the market, semi-cooked food. That preservation elements in that food are extremely harmful for the body. I'll come back to this point in my second part of my presentation. And then we have the problem of uh, social and ethnic com conflicts uh, arising due to glaring disparity of income and wealth, due to unemployment, due to intolerance and ego, and uh, easy access to weapons. So these are, uh, you, you can see a large number of areas where there are social con conflicts in Asia, in Africa and Middle East. Uh, there are, you, I'm sure you are reading in the newspapers, the so-called Arab Spring is no, nothing but a social unrest of some sort which has a region. And the problems in Sudan, problems in Mali, the problems in Mauritania, there are many countries in the world, uh, Darfur, where are all kinds of social conflicts. Then we have the problem of international terrorism, and you have seen 9-11 uh, in US, what happened, you have seen 
in Mumbai what happened in 2008. Uh, you have seen in many other parts of the world uh, where terrorism, uh, even in Europe, in Spain you had these bombings, in London you had these bombings, in many parts of the world how these problems are coming because of intolerance, extremism, the modern technology allows them to have uh, access to all kinds of weapon systems, all kinds of explosives, chemicals, and uh, then of course poverty and, employment and, and unemployment is contributing to this problem. So this is a gist of the, uh, uh, the major challenges we face and you will face in 21st century. There are many more but I think this gives you a sort of overview of the challenges. Now let us have a look at Okay. Now let us have a look at the modern science, the contribution of the modern science. I think this is a little bit uh, the modern science has <coughs> overlapped there somewhere. Now what modern science has done and what ancient wisdom can do? Now modern science has created these large scale production units. You go to a factory, you have thousand cars coming out and people just doing, you know, like human and human being is becoming robot. They just put something like this whole day, eight hours a day. That's the kind of uh, production units we have. You go, I don't know whether you have seen some of these units. You go to the factory here or you go to Mercedes factory or you go to electronics unit or you go to a garment manufacturing or you go to a, uh, you know, this food processing unit. Everywhere this is the same thing. They, they, they call it assembly line production in which your role is just to put, say for example, this glass like this whole day, eight hours like this. This, this is the kind of process people are doing. And because of this, uh, the production is easy, but then people are not needed because it's tremendous automation, so you don't get employment. The production is coming out of machinery because the machinery, you are ready to invest into machinery, but you are not ready to invest into human beings. You see, you, you, you produce a huge big plant using tremendous amount of cement and tremendous amount of steel and all kinds of metals and then uh, you put up that plant, you make huge investment into it, you pollute the atmosphere, you uh, extract all kinds of minerals from the earth, but then you also deprive the human beings of their employment. You don't get employment because uh, the people are not needed in those plants anymore. The machinery uh, takes care of uh, the production part of it. So this is uh, one contribution of the modern science. And because of this huge, uh, big production lines, you have concentration of wealth, which I was talking about disparity of income and distribution. Because these plants are huge, you have plants producing million units of, say, genes per day. Now those plants are owned by one or two individuals, rest are, all of us are employed there at the mercy of those people and you are stressed because you don't know at what time you can lose your employment and the, the boss might say tomorrow you, you are no longer needed, goodbye, bye bye, so you have stress all the employees. On the other hand, this concentration of wealth because those two, three people own the whole wealth which was distributed into thousands of units earlier when we had small scale production units. Then we have these innovations, new innovations every day, we call them, uh, you know, you go to the market, you will find a new cell phone and a new car and a new, uh, you know, computer or a new technology every day and which gives you temptation to buy new, which creates a stress. So this guy has the latest model of mobile phone, I have very old ones, so you feel bad and you want to stress, you want to buy a new one to, you know, compete with your guy. The same thing happens for the car, same thing happens for a dress, same thing happens for a jewelry, same thing happens for a watch, you know, in whole, uh, because of this process of uh, so-called <coughs> innovation, you have a lot more temptation and a lot more stress. Then increasing the income you need because you need to satisfy all the growing demands. The demands are created 
you must have a new phone, you must have a new computer, you must have a, uh, this thing new or that thing new and the apartment should be redesigned as per this technique, that technique, so you need more and more income which also creates a stress on you. Now, <coughs> this kind of new things you can produce only when you take the raw material from the mother earth, you see. You have to extract metals, you have to extract minerals, you have to take energy, you have to take water to produce them. So there is disproportionate exploitation of the mother earth today. It is estimated that in the last hundred years we have exploited nature more than our ancestors did in 5000 years before. So you can imagine the amount of uh, uh, stress we have created for the nat nature and how much exploitation we are doing for this nature because of our growing desires. And of course there is a race, unbridled race for to control the natural resources. Every country wants to control energy resources, mineral resources, metal resources. You see international politics is dominated by this today. So this is another big, uh, big problem. This is causing a very, very serious uh, threat to the ecosystem and increasing our stress levels. So this is the contribution of uh, modern science and modern technology to uh, human life. Now, in the medical sciences as well, there have been a uh, lot of, as you see, the tremendous uh, development. You can have all kinds of surgeries today, there are all kinds of uh, uh, what you call diagnostic equipment are available which never existed say 50 years ago. You have ECG and I don't even know the CT scan and all kinds of things are possible today. But these are all misplaced because these uh, uh, medical uh, tools are based on a very wrong premise which I will explain to you in later part of my presentation and therefore they consider human being as a chemical and physical composition. They don't consider human being as a human being. They consider him as uh, something like you see um, you have a you go to a market and you buy some medicine it has chemical composition they consider human being something like that that we are made of so and so chemicals and therefore if you add this chemical this thing would be rectified, if you reduce this, this would be rectified and you will be healthy. This is the science behind uh, the modern medical, uh, you could say medications. Now let me, the virtual world has now become very important, though we are connected, everybody is connected now. Eh? You have every second connection, you have um, mobile phones and you have uh, what you call uh, uh, internet without uh, what you call uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, so you are totally connected. Uh, you know, from early morning you get up 6 o'clock, you are connected. And till the midnight when you sleep you are connected. You want to see all messages, you want to see everything which is coming and going. But despite that you are very lonely. Because you are only connected on the virtual world, you are not connected with human beings anymore. You are not even connected with your own self. You don't know who you are. So now let us go to the uh, main part of my presentation. Now, what does ancient wisdom say? Do you firstly do you agree with the, what I said about the challenges of this century and uh, some analysis of what modern science has done. You agree with me? Yes. Okay. Now, what I will tell you is again a pure science. Okay? But it is much higher science than we think it is. And I will explain you how. First, let us talk about uh, how much time we will have. You still have half an hour. Only half an hour? Uh, more than one because of the question. Depending on the... On yeah. the okay. Now, you see we have... We must understand one thing in life. That this nature... What is the constitution of this nature? What is this uh, universe surrounding us? What it is? And who we are? These are two questions 
which we must understand and ask ourselves. And how can we understand this? The first is the constitution of nature. As per the ancient wisdom, and you will feel yourself, there is nothing beyond that. The five basic elements constitute this entire nature. The first element is the space, you know, the space or ether as we call it. In, in Sanskrit they call it antriksh. So it, it is the combination of a space and ether. This is the space. Hmm? Nothing can exist without the space. If you don't have a space, nothing can exist. It's impossible even for me to exist without the space, not, not possible. So the first thing created was the space so that everything else can exist. The second part of the creation is the air. <coughs> you see the air which gives us life, which we breathe all the time in and out. This is the second important creation of nature. The third creation of nature is the fire. Fire is like energy. The sun is the symbol of fire, but it is fire is more far more pervasive. It is the source of energy for all of us. Every energy which have every form of energy, it comes from fire. And then the, we have water and the earth. And this is the order of creation as well. They were created first in that order. The space first, the air second, then the fire, then the water, and then the earth. Modern science also accepts this partly. They say that the earth was a big ball of fire once upon a time, and then it froze and became into a, a frozen water, and then it became earth. So they do accept to some extent that it was fire, and then the water, and then it became earth. But this order is very clear in Vedic writings and also in Greek writings that this is the way the entire nature was created. Then we have on the earth plants and vegetation and uh, we survive because of the food we get, the water we get, air we get in this, on this nature. The functioning of nature is absolutely mathematical. I was telling Dr. Mosson that Nothing in this universe is by hazard. Everything is mathematical. Now let me give you one or two examples of this mathematics. You have millions of stars in the sky, isn't it? If there is no mathematics, they can collide any time. And there could be havoc in this universe. You have the in our own solar system, you have sun, you have moon, you have planets. They rotate and they revolve in precise terms. From today, 20,000 years ahead, you can calculate what would be the moment of the sun. When there would be a solar eclipse, when there would be a lunar eclipse. You can calculate anything in mathematics. Even if you look at, for example, water cycle, it is very important for us, for our life. Imagine the functioning of the nature. If you have to carry 10 liters of water from here to uh, Dr. Masson's office, how much effort you will have to make? Even 10 liters of water. Imagine. Huh? You will have to bring buckets and carry and you have to find the water and carry it all the way. If there are no lifts, you have to carry it on the stairs and all that. Look at the nature. Billions and trillions of tons of water is lifted every second from the oceans, from the lakes and from the rivers and goes into the space up. Every second it is lifted and it forms clouds. Then the wind moves it around the world. Thousands and thousands of kilometers it moves and then the condensation process takes place and it falls in the form of uh, snow or rain or you know, uh, the water vapor or in some other form. It comes back to us to make us live. This has been designed to make the humanity live. If this cycle does not exist, we cannot live. The end of human life will be there, straight, because there would be no fresh water. So just imagine this. <laughs> we don't recognize now that we are breathing in oxygen and we are breathing out carbon dioxide. How it happens? It happens automatically. We don't make any effort at all. But it is happening. There are 300 people in this room. Do we have any problem? 
The nature has designed it that way. So nature's functioning is absolutely precise and mathematical. It is the most intelligent functioning. So we should not discount that ever. Look at the energy cycle, how energy cycle works. Energy is never destroyed. It's created, recreated, converts into various forms. Look at the nature's functioning. The plants grow as soon as spring comes. The plants will you know, become green. The flowers will come. Fruits will come. And as soon as autumn comes, they all fall down. Why it happens? How it happens? There's a design behind it. It cannot happen accidentally. Why we have winter now, the snow is falling, and after that we will have summer, the, the heat will come. Why? This is all by design. There is some designer who is very intelligent who has done all this. So, this is the uh, miracle of nature. And we are surviving because of nature, because the food we eat comes from nature. <coughs> Tell me any other source of food. Even if somebody eats uh, flesh, the flesh eating animal eats plants and vegetables, isn't it? If you eat beef for example, the cow eats plant and vegetables. The original food comes from plants and vegetables which come, which are grown on this earth. The fruits, plant, vegetables, cereals, everything. So the food which makes us survive comes from the earth, from the nature. The water we drink for our existence comes from nature. The air we breathe in comes from nature. So we are surviving because of nature, we are sustaining ourselves because of nature. If something goes wrong with this, we will be endangering our own lives. Nature does not need us. Nature will exist whether humanity exists or not. So it's not a coexistence as they say, it is not coexistence. It is our existence which is at peril, which is at risk, not the nature's existence. Nature will always exist. So let us think about this part very important. This is very important to understand the nature. I can speak for hours on this part. There are many, many things which are very important on this issue. But I want to skip that little bit and now I would go to the self. Who you are? Very little. It's, it's a topic which I can speak for days together but let me give you a very brief outline on who you are. Have you ever thought who you are? Hmm? Have you ever thought? Hmm? Some, some heads are nodding, some, some people are thinking about it. Hmm? Now when I say, this is what? This is my hand? Hmm? Isn't it? This is my body? Isn't it? If I ask you what is this, this is my body. Isn't it? This is my hair. And this is my face. This is my nose. So we say my. That is my. This is my glass. This is also my. It's a possessive pronoun. Eh? This is my laptop. So what is the difference between the body and laptop? It's my body, my laptop. It's a possessive pronoun. Who possesses it? You understand possessive pronoun? There's somebody who is the owner of it. Who is the owner of your body? Have you ever thought of it? So we will, we will analyze that little bit now. The body is made of what? The body is a huge, large body, is the largest part of our constitution. It is made of the same five elements which I mentioned about constituting the nature. The same five elements, the space, the air, the fire, the water and the earth. There is nothing else in this body apart from those five elements. And you have five senses of perception and five senses of action. Why they have been designed that way? Because they are related to the nature. The sense of hearing comes from the ether, from the space. It's linked to the space all the time. Without a space you can't hear anything. The sense of touch is linked to the air. All touch sense power derives from air. When air blows you feel the touch you see. This, the, the sense of sight is linked to the fire. As soon as the sun goes out, you can't see. You need light to see. Without light, you can't see. 
the sense of sight is linked to fire. The sense of taste is linked to water. All taste originate from water. And the sense of smell is linked to the earth. All smells originate from earth. So we, our body, is constitutive of those five elements. Our senses are directly linked to those five elements. <coughs> and therefore, and we breathe in and out. We are linked to this universe through this breath. If this stops, our link to the universe stops it's immediately. So we are directly connected to the mother nature. This is the relationship between the nature and the human being. Now, anyway, I'm talking about the human being understanding the self. Let's go a little bit more. The human being has another four elements apart from these five elements which I mentioned. There's an element which uh, the, the body is one, senses are second. The body is large, but senses are controlling our body. This large body, which is very miraculous, which is fantastic, it's functioning, it's beyond imagination, you know. It creates the uh, the water and the food and cereal you eat into what? Blood, flesh, bones. It's such a miraculous body inside. And it is all alive and it creates these dead here, here, right here. If you, if you, it needs food, it makes you hungry. It, when it needs water, it makes you thirsty. When it wants you to uh, dispose the waste, it makes you to go to toilet. When it needs rest, it makes you sleepy. It's a very intelligent creation, but it is very weak. It's the weakest part of the human constitution. It is controlled by five senses of action, five senses of perception. If you cannot see, cannot hear, if you cannot smell, cannot eat, cannot speak, what is the body? Body is like a vegetable. You agree? Is it not science what I am saying? Do you agree with me or not? Okay. Now, the, the senses are not as important as we think. They are not as powerful. They control the body, but they are not as powerful. They are the second weakest part of the human constitution. They are controlled by mind. You see, you are listening to me because, not because of ears, because your mind is with me. If your mind is traveling in a shopping mall or if your mind is traveling in, a, in your kitchen in your house, then you will not be able to listen to me. Sometimes it happens to you are sitting in a classroom, the teacher has told you half an hour something, but you didn't hear anything <coughs> because your mind was traveling somewhere else. Your ears were all here, isn't it? But your mind was not here. So it is the mind which hears, it is the mind which sees, it is the mind which smells, it is the mind which tastes, <coughs> it is the mind which touches. All the functions are done with the, with the senses are only an instrument at the disposal of mind. The mind is, don't even exist, where it exists, can you tell me? Can you see it? Can you touch it? Yeah? Can you hear it? No? You see? So this mind is, this is another thing which I am coming, I will explain to you a little later. But the mind is the one which controls your senses. But the mind is very volatile. Mind is the most volatile part of human constitution. It's the fastest traveling thing in this universe. If with the mind in a second you can go to Washington, sec third second you can go to Delhi, in a fraction of a second you can go to the Bresson, in a fraction of a second you can go in your childhood. It's the only thing which can take you back in time. Nothing else can take you back in time. Nothing, whatever you can do. You can never go back in your childhood physically, never impossible. Hmm? But mind can take you back. This is the power of mind, you see. There are many, many things in my mind. I don't want to go into more details on that. But it's a very volatile instrument at the same time. Because it's like waves in the ocean. It creates waves in your mind, in your body. The mind creates waves. Let's have this thing. This is very beautiful thing. I must buy this. Oh, I must buy this car. I must buy this cell phone. I must buy this dress. Oh, oh that girl looking so beautiful. Why can't I have that dress? Oh, that jewel is fantastic. You know, it, it creates waves in your, in your body, in your senses. Senses and mind, they create waves in you. 
So it's a very volatile, it needs to be controlled. We have an instrument within ourselves which is called intellect, which controls the mind. Huh? Intellect, it keeps interacting with the mind all the time. You all the time interact. Oh, this is good to do, this is not good to do. Can I do this? Should I do it? And this is legal, this is not illegal. Oh, I can't drink because I have to drive. Huh? I, I should not shout because this is not good. You have this interaction with your mind all the time. The intellect keep interacting with your mind. So intellect is a layer which is higher than the mind. It keeps controlling the mind all the time. Mind is without boundaries. It just, uh, you know, wanders here and there. It, it's a wanderer, mind. Intellect tries to bring it within certain limits. It doesn't succeed all the time, but it does succeed sometimes. And beyond mind is ego, human ego. Your ego overtakes everything. Mentally you might say, oh, this is the right thing to do, but this guy, you know, I must teach him a lesson because he gave me such a big insult in that moment. I must take this revenge. That comes from ego. I should become the most powerful man in, in this country. I should become the richest man in this country. Oh, I'm so knowledgeable. I'm professor, rector of this university. Who is this guy challenging me? So the ego comes. Ego overtakes uh, even intellect, you see. It, when your ego is hurt, you feel very bad. This is uh, another composition of the human constitution. And the last composition of the human body is the human soul. Which some of you may not believe, but let me now explain this how. You will notice in this, in this theory, this is not a theory, but this is in the science, that the bigger and the gross a part is, the less powerful it is. The body is big, but it is controlled by small senses. Senses are small and they control the body. The mind which doesn't even exist, you can't even find where it is. It controls all your senses and body. Hmm? Intellect is even more subtle than the mind. Hmm? It's even thinner than mind and it controls your mind. Their ego, it, it's, it's also in thin air completely. And then it controls the rest of it. And the soul is not even physical. Rest of all, rest, all the elements are physical except the soul, which is non-physical. Which doesn't even exist in any physical form. And once it leaves your body, you are dead. Your body is dead, your senses are dead, your mind is dead, your ego is dead, your intellect is dead, everything is dead. When the soul enters the process, the conception takes place. The conception is not biological, the conception is not chemical. You, you must have seen these theories, you know, how human being and life has originated. That it's a very clear ancient wisdom that the human life, the conception takes place with entry of soul at the time of conception. The body is made of the five elements because it comes from the food. The food we eat becomes your body. What is your body? Every day you eat something which becomes your body, which replenishes your flesh and blood and your bones every day. So this is your body. This is of the five elements. And the soul is the one which sustains it. Soul is like the foundation of this building. Once the foundation is gone, the building collapses. It's like a root of a tree. Once the roots are gone, the tree falls. It is dead. We don't see the foundation because we are not supposed to see it. That's why we don't recognize the soul because we are not supposed to see it. So the things become more and more subtle, more and more smaller, they become more and more powerful. This is the mystery of creation. And they become more and more gross, they become less powerful. This is also the theory of creation of nature. The space is the most powerful part of the creation of nature, followed by air, followed by fire, followed by water, followed by earth. Earth is the least powerful. And I will give you one or two examples to explain this. I'll just give you one example. I think we are exceeding the time. No, you have. Yeah. 
just one example to explain the power of, I call it power of insensible. Hmm? I won't take, let me take the example of space. Now, in the modern science, you can't define a space. What is a space? They say, between this hand and this hand, what exists in the space? So they will say, between moon and earth, what exists in the space? That's what they define, isn't it? That's how you define space. Because there's nothing in the space. Is there anything there? It's empty, there's nothing there. But you would not believe it has everything which you can imagine in this, in this empty space. Everything you can imagine exists in this space. To begin with, the air we are breathing in is in this space, isn't it? How will you breathe in and breathe out if there is no air in this space? The energy, the entire sun energy is absorbed by the space. You feel sitting in the air conditioned room, you feel suffocated, then you go out and you feel fresh air. How? The energy comes there. The energy is there in the, in the space. Then you have humidity. This is water. What is humidity? It's water. It is there in the space. Inside here you feel warm. What is that? That heat is there in the space. Outside you will feel cold. That cold is there in the space, in this empty space. You have a hundred story building. Hmm? It goes on fire one day. It reduces to small little air. Hmm? What happens to that building? What happens? It disappears into this space. In this empty space, this whole building disappears. Whole city goes on fire and the whole city disappears into this space. Hmm? If I am hearing, you are hearing me, it is because of this space. If we are existing, it is because of this space. No existence is possible without this space. So this is just to give you a brief example. There are many, many things which uh, to tell you the power of the insensible. Things which we do not understand are more powerful. Because we give too much emphasis on our senses, senses are very weak. They are not as powerful as we think they are. So now understanding the nature, understanding the self briefly, now let us see what is the purpose of human life. Why are we here? Why are we born? What is the purpose? Are we supposed to just eat, drink, uh, uh, marry, produce children and die? Is that the purpose of life? I think if I ask you what is the purpose of life, what will you say? What will be your answer? What do you want in life? Happiness. <laughs> Happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. This is the only purpose of life. There cannot be any other purpose of life. This is the way it is designed. Everybody wants to be happy. If you want to accumulate wealth, you are accumulating it because you think it will make you happy. If you are uh, becoming powerful, you want to contest election and become prime minister, you think that will make you happy. So that, that's why you are doing it. If you want to have a big business and accumulate a huge big factory, you think it, is, it will make you happy, that's why you are doing it. So the only purpose of human life can only be one, that is happiness. Nothing else is possible because the very nature of human soul, which is the owner of this body, I talked about the soul who is the owner, this is my body, the body is owned by the soul. The soul is the owner of the body. The body is mine, the me is soul, nothing else. So the soul which is the owner of this body, its basic character is <coughs> happiness. This soul comes from the universal soul. <coughs> it's a universal soul like the space, the space exists everywhere. Same way there is a universal soul which exists everywhere. In every single particle of this universe, the soul exists. And we are part of that universal soul. And the basic character of that soul is happiness. The three, the many, many properties, but three basic properties. In Sanskrit they call it Satchit Anand. Sat means eternal. It is, it does not depreciate, it does not change, it does not mutate. No mutation is possible. Hmm? No change is possible. Chit is consciousness. It is alive. It gives you consciousness. And anand means happiness. 
So these are the three primary characters of the universal soul, which are also the characters of human soul. We come from the same root, like water, wherever you drop, it will travel towards the ocean. Wherever you drop water, it will travel towards the ocean. When two Indians meet in New York, they will oh, wow. they feel happy with each other because they are same, you know, language they can communicate, come from the same country. And if two people come from the Bresson here, they will feel happy I come from the same town. So it's a natural association. This is the association of human soul to the universal soul and therefore that is the purpose of human life. Now how do we get uh, happiness? This is the question and why don't we get it? You know, we remain prisoner of our senses and mind. Senses and mind keep us entangled in this world. The senses, you look at beautiful advertisement, oh, this is a wonderful advertisement of a dress, a beautiful advertisement of a cell phone, beautiful advertisement of a car, a beautiful advertisement of a house. And your mind makes that image, oh, we should get it, we should get it. Now that is, keeps you engaged in this world all the time. These de desires, these are the desires. They keep you engaged. They give you some happiness for a little while, and then it gives you unhappiness because somebody else has something better or something else better is available in the market therefore you want to have something better. So it gives you temporary happiness, transient happiness and then converts into unhappiness. So this is the cycle we keep revolving all the time. Pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain. This is the way the world is designed. This is the way we, in, in Sanskrit we call it Maya. This is the cycle of Maya, which keeps you engaged in this world all the time. Now in order to, it's also called Trishna. Trishna is a word, it's like a mirage, you know, you want more and more and more. If you have uh, a small bicycle, you want to have a, uh, a small car. If you have a small car, you want to have a bigger car. If you have a bigger car, you want to have a Ferrari. If you have a Ferrari, you want to have five Ferraris. Uh, if you have one house, you want to have one flat in Budapest also. Then if you have one in Budapest, why not in Paris? Then if you have one in Paris, then why not in Washington, you know? This is the way the, the desires work. This is called Trishna. You are never, never happy. It, it leads you, when you are satisfied, four more comes out. So this is a geometric progression of desires. And this is why we are always in this cycle of GDP, gross domestic product. It should go up. Every time it should go up, then only we will be happy. That is what your leaders tell you, that is what the economists tell you, that is what you think that you will have higher income, you will be happier. Yeah, the per capita income should go up, the, the gross domestic product of the nation should go up. This is what the cycle is. This is what we are calling it development. This is how we define development today. To which I'm, you can call me anti-development, but this is totally a wrong path. It's a destructive path on which we are following. This is the path which is destroying the nature. Because how do you create more GDP? How do you create more per capita income? You can create through more consumption, isn't it? If you consume more, you need more production. More production, how will you have it? For more production, you need natural resources. You need uh, more energy. You need more water. You need more minerals. You need more, uh, you know, uh, these agricultural products coming on, coming out from this nature. So, we destroy the nature in this process of higher GDP. And this GDP concept comes from the Trishna, from our desires, which are infinite. They are infinite. They will never come to an end. Your needs are limited. Desires are unlimited. Desires are infinite. So we get an illusion happiness. We get a sense of happiness for a short while and then again it becomes unhappy. At the end of the day, if you feel oh, very unhappy, then you go and drink, you go and smoke, and then you relax a little bit, and then again it comes back. You see. This is what happens in life. So I think I will skip part of it now, but I will come to the last part, which balance with moderation. Firstly, I think even the Christian philosophy says that we do not live to eat. 
isn't it? We eat to live. The purpose of human life is not to eat, <laughs> but in order to survive, we eat. We, therefore, the purpose of human life should not be quenching these desires all the time, fulfilling these desires, because these are infinite. You will never come to an end. Your grandparents had less desires than you. They were happier than you are. At least I can see about my grandfather, who is much happier than uh, my generation age. So you will never be achieving the level of happiness with this growing desires. They will create more stress in your mind. But you need more income to satisfy those desires. You have to work harder. You have to compete with the rest of the world. So you are in a cycle of stress and stress and stress all the time. The, the needs are limited human needs must be satisfied. Everybody should get something to eat, something to live in, clothing to wear, eh? and medical help if it is needed. So one must get that. But beyond that, those desires are infinite, insatiable. So that is one part of the balance. The second way we should not become prisoner of our senses. You know, we have become prisoner of our senses. We are not master of our senses. Right? Like my, uh, uh, you know, driver sometimes he puts in the GPS the route where I have to go, and he says GPS is saying so I should go in this direction. I said no, the GPS should be your instrument. You should be the master of GPS. GPS should not be your master is guiding you. You see where you want to go, and then you. You, you don't blindly follow these things. You don't blindly follow the senses. Senses will lead you to the path of infinite desires, to the path of Krishna. You should avoid that path. Happiness lies in contentment. It is if you are content, if you are happy with what you have, if you are content with what you have, you will be happy. The stress is the cause of unhappiness. So reduce your stress levels. You have to reduce. The stress levels will be reduced when you are able to control your desires. You feel that it is not needed for me. Why have to compete for unnecessarily? I should be happy. I want happiness. So there's a, I don't have enough time to go into that, but I can sometime else take another session on how we can reach the level of happiness. So let us not get into the cycle of GDP and higher income constantly. Let's not get into the cycle of desires. Let's not destroy the mother nature. Because if we destroy the mother nature, we are not destroying nature, we are destroying ourselves. We are destroying our own race. The human race will not exist. Our children will have no place on this earth. So remember that. So this is where we are. And once we connect ourselves with the soul, if you think that we are soul and you are connecting with the soul, you will feel the whole humanity is one because we are part of the same same uh, universal soul. We are all one. The universal soul is each one of us. We are connected. Then you will not hate anybody. You will only love because there is no hatred. The hatred comes out of the the, the, the physical part, the body part which is not me. The body is just a covering. It's only a clothing for me. The soul is the owner. As I change my clothes when they become old, eh, the soul changes the body when the body becomes old. So the whole universe is soul. It is not body. And we are connected. So if we start connecting with each other, we will have no hatred for each other. We will have only love for everybody. It would be like, I will treat her like my I treat myself. Then how can I hate her? If I treat her as I treat myself, it's not possible. But you never hate yourself. How can you hate... Uh, if you connect everybody with the same uh, universal soul, you will love everything. You will love the nature, you will love the uh, animals, and you will love all the humans. That would be what we call uh, uh, unity. That will lead to unity of the nature, unity of the humankind. So before I conclude, let me uh, reiterate two Sanskrit slokas. One is, Ayam nij paroveti ganana laghu chetsam udar charitanam tu vasudeva kutumbakam. 
I am amazed. This is mine. This is yours. This kind of thinking is for those people who have lower mentality. People with higher mentality, the whole Vasudha, the whole earth is one single family. Vasudheva Kutumbakam, that is, whole earth is one single family for those who have higher mentality, who have higher thinking. For those who have lower thinking, they feel this is mine, this is yours. So let us think that we are all one, we are all one single family. That is one thing. The second thing, about the universal soul, there is a very beautiful sloka in Vedic writings. This says, Poon madah, Poon midam, Poon nat, Poon mudachyate, Poon nash, Poon madar, Poon meva vashishyate. Poon means complete in every respect. This word Poon is coming every time you will see in this sloka. Complete in every respect and infinite in nature. So, a God or hope, uh, uh, Almighty, you are complete and infinite in every nature. Whatever you have created is also complete and infinite. The whole nature is complete. We are also complete. We are representative of the universe. Huh? And the infinite goes out of infinite. What remains is also infinite. Isn't it mathematically true? The infinite comes out of infinite, what remains is infinite. This is the explanation of this universe. It's something like you have, let me give you an example of modern era. You have a CD compact disc, okay, on which you have music or a software, for example. Now, you load the software in millions of computers with the same compact disc. This original disc remains complete, isn't it? And you are also, whatever you have loaded in millions of computers is also complete. Isn't it? You can load it in trillions of computers, the original will not depreciate. This is the nature of the creator. Creator has created this universe with variety of things. Not only humans, but all other species and the nature. And they, whatever he has created is complete, as I explained the functioning of the nature. And even after creating that completeness, he remains complete all the time. So thank you very much, Kasanam Sepan, and I'll be happy to answer some questions if you have. Thank you very much, His Excellency. And first, I would like to give the floor and ask Professor Peter Morton, our Vice Rector, whether you have any uh, comments or questions, even about mathematics and science, or or whatever you would like to add to you. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Rector. <laughs> Uh, to write a few words uh, for his excellence. And I tried, I started to write that, so I looked back to the end, I, I, I wrote a few words. So as you asked me, or it was a surprise for me, <laughs> I can tell you a few words what I wrote here. Okay, fantastic. So uh, for me, this uh, lecture it contained three main parts. Uh, the first one, it was about the challenges about the modern science. It was in some sense a, a really nice summary of what we more or less know. All right, uh, the second part, I would like to add this now, it was really a, a, a new one, especially how it integrated that knowledge we, we more or less know, we heard about the internet and so on, but for me at least, like a person, uh, it, it was a new one. And the third part, which is probably the most important, it was the purpose of life. I must say that if you are at my age, so you are too young, more, most of you. <laughs> so probably for you, it's, it's a bit early to think about who I am. Uh, of course, it's, it's good to think always about this kind of things. But, but, but you can't say who you are, because you, you are, how to say, in a kind of uh, development, in a kind of production, if you talk in a modern world. But actually, by 64, you are more or less ready, and you know who you are. 
So in this sense, I like this part uh, that uh, that you came anyway from another culture, and that I was, and I, I understood that your culture is very much the same as ours, and that you think about this kind of things, how you reach this kind of things. And now I am at the end of my notes. <laughs> uh, I haven't finished yet, but I want me to tell you a few more words. So we. Uh, I don't do his excellency that because of I don't know what reason, but uh, the internet generations of our university, uh, probably the University of India, and uh, our university is uh, not so developed as they should be. So in this sense, we are glad of myself, we are glad to see you here, and I hope that there will be some kind of more development based on these personal issues and based on of the state university issues. I think it was a bit long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. And of course we open the floor and give the opportunity for all of you to raise questions to His Excellency regarding uh, his lecture mainly, but of course regarding related issues as well. You can raise it even in either in English or in Hungarian and we try to translate it into English to His Excellency. So the floor is yours and hopefully there will be some questions. Be brave enough. I think they're, they're all happy now. Yeah, they are very happy. Yeah. All yeah, contingent. Well. Yes, the first question is here. Yeah, the third part about the, of the presentation mm -hmm. was about uh, the purpose of life mm -hmm. and how we should live it. Is that was that more the um, individual purpose of life or a way of thinking universal? So how the world should think. Or is it individual thinking, so how I can be happier? You see, each one of us is a universe in our search. So it cannot be common purpose for everybody. Common purpose is happiness, okay? But the way we work it out has to be individual. Because your constitution of body is different than my constitution. Though they are the same layers as I explained to everybody. But those layers are so different. We can be identified on the basis of our uh, fingertips, isn't it? So human body is very complex. The body, senses, mind, the intellect, ego. So they are very complex creation. So we are different. So we have to understand ourselves first. Look inside yourself. Do some introspection. What is causing turbulence in me? What is causing stress in me? How can I reduce it? How can I control it? And that thinking will lead you to find an answer to this. And that answer you ultimately find is, will be that you have to live with contentment. What you have, you have to be content with that. There's nothing wrong in uh, using less like Mahatma Gandhi was called half naked fakir by uh, Winston Churchill when he traveled to London. I think we need more half naked fakirs today in this world rather than people with high consumption. Then only we can save this, this uh, nature for our posterity. We need less and less consumption. That should be the uh, motto of life. The less you consume from the nature, the more enlightened you are. Like a unit, a production unit in economics, it's considered more efficient if you take less input, isn't it? For the same output, if you take less input, you are considered more efficient. Same way as a human being, if you are taking less from the nature, you are more enlightened. So I think the ultimate answer will come there, but you have to work it out through your own self-introspection because you are a different person than I am and you are a different person from the rest of uh, anybody else here in this, in this uh, room or in this universe for that matter. questions or any remarks? Yes? Uh, according to the first part of your presentation, you uh, were um, saying about the challenges of the 21st century and uh, I was wondering whether how we could uh, avoid stress and how we could remain healthy and uh, balanced without these challenges of the 21st century and uh, among 
among uh, these situations we live in, you know, the international um, questions and so on? I think first of all we have to start thinking that the so-called concept of GDP and development is not correct. It's a negative concept. It only gives rise to more desires and more stress. The countries which have higher per capita GDP or higher per capita income, they are more stressed than Hungarians. I've seen countries like Finland, US, people have poor health, their stress, high alcoholism, high drugs, you know, loneliness. These are the features which will happen when you have more and more income. So first we have to think in that direction, individually. Secondly, there is a difference between individual thinking and the collective movement of the society. Sometimes you cannot escape the collective movement of the society. For example, 100 years ago everybody used to ride horses, but today if you come to university with your horse, people will laugh at you because the collective movement of the society has changed. You have different mode of transportation. So sometimes you have to go with the collective movement of society, but at the same time, Keep educating yourself and your colleagues that this is not the right way. We should change our thinking. Once you change the thinking, you become agent of change. And then you have people like Mahatma Gandhi who can transform, or Mandela or uh, Mother Teresa who can transform the world. I think some of us will transform this world. The path has to be reversed. The path has to be less consumption. The path has to be more austerity. <laughs> Another question of yours, yes? Uh, my question now is for the first part of the presentation. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, I was wondering, uh, was, um, could overpopulation be put in there as a negative effect for the future? Because as we know that scarcity of resources are limited, but there's a tendency of overpopulation. So what can be done to... You see, overpopulation is a problem, but it is not a serious problem. This nature has enough for all people on this earth. You, even if you double the population, you have enough for all people. Enough for the needs, not for the desires. That is the question. If you, today's wealth, if it is properly distributed, you will have no trace of hunger anywhere in the world. But on the one hand, you have so much plenty, the problems are rising out of plenty. Illnesses because of plenty, illnesses because overeating, eating bad food, eating bad habits, having bad habits. Hmm? And on the other hand, the people don't have enough to eat. So the problems are not because of that there is not enough. There is more than enough. The problems are because of the distribution is not good. The people's greed has gone up. And there is enough for the needs, not enough for desires. Never enough for desires. Is there any other question? Even if Anything else? Hungarian. Maybe the, the back benches did not hear me properly perhaps. My sound was reaching you. So? Yes or no? Maybe, maybe the language was a barrier because you understand Hungarian better than English. If there is no question of the students. I just want to share a good news with uh, High Excellency, uh, His Excellency, that uh, there is a new measurement, uh, and hopefully those who deal with alternative economics. Uh, have heard about it, that there is already gross national happiness measured. And there is a tiny country in Asia, Bhutan. Not, far, not far from India, Bhutan. Bhutan. Yes, they measure their development in gross national happiness, not by GDP. And just recently I heard from the news that in the U.S., they will measure their development by happiness as well. So I think there is something already, there has been started something in, so towards what you have told us, that the aim of our life is happiness. But how to reach that, it's an other question. So thank you very much, His Excellency, for your nice and very informative presentation.
and thanks for coming to us. And we would like to thank it uh, on behalf of uh, the leadership of our university. And this is a gift from our university. It's a book uh, published about our university. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the end, I would like to tell you that you can buy uh, His Excellency's book uh, 